We give a lot of credence to thought leaders these days. The gurus, executives, the authors, who all seem to have something profound to say about a number of topics. But the original thought leader doesn't seem to receive much love or attention with respect to our modern chaotic lives. Of course, I'm talking about Plato. The time in which he lived was also rich in innovation, just like we are today. Of course, it was political, cultural, and intellectual innovation. It's an era that gave rise to developing Western culture of the time and of eras afterwards, centuries afterwards. Well known for his great works on ethics and politics, Plato's work also tapped into some of the definitive models of leadership that are still relevant today. In doing so, we find the concept of leadership to be elusive, or perhaps constantly morphing, as it can be many things to many people. In an era when we're embracing a diversity of thought, how is it that one of the greats in the pantheon of dead white males is perfectly suited for our needs today? Are these models simply an outgrowth of his time, or are they baked into human nature? Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? Dolly Parton said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership. Principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the first century. This is Timeless Leadership. Hello and welcome once again to Timeless Leadership, where we explore principles and virtues that accompany admirable and successful leaders. Thank you for considering this show worthy of your time. It's my hope that we can provide you with the type of quality conversation that keeps you coming back. We do these shows live each week here on Twitter Spaces, and then we package them up for listening later. So if you're tuning in now and can't stick around for the whole thing, or if you tune in late, uh, you can catch the whole thing as a podcast wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And of course... I'd encourage you to subscribe to my Timeless and Timely newsletter where I regularly write about leadership, communication, and history at TimelessTimely.com. This week we're talking about models of leadership in Plato and beyond. R. Edward Freeman is a lifelong student of philosophy, martial arts, and the blues. Ed is a prolific educator, consultant, and speaker, best known for his work on the topics of stakeholder management and business ethics. He also teaches leading with meaning, helping organizations create a culture that brings out the best in everyone. Professor Friedman is perhaps best known for his award-winning book, Strategic Management, a Stakeholder Approach, first published in 1984 and reissued in 2010. It's a landmark book, said to have helped to define and shape our understanding of how good management practice really is based on relationships. Relationships with the stakeholders who both comprise and affect and are affected by the business. Ed is the author or co-author of five other books, author or editor of over 100 volumes and 200 articles in the areas of stakeholder management, business strategy, and business ethics. His most recent book, is Models of Leadership in Plato and Beyond, co-authored with Dominic Scott. Ed joined the Darden 
Graduate School of Business Administration in 1987, where he's currently University Professor and Ellis and Tine Olson Professor of Business Administration. At Darden and beyond, he's been recognized with a variety of outstanding teacher awards. He also has a number of appointments as professor, adjunct professor, and visiting professor in academic institutions around the world. Ed is a co-founder and keyboardist in the house band of Red Goat Records, a record label modeled after those pioneers from Motown and Stax who combined great artists with creative songwriters in a high-energy house band. And finally, Ed is a co-principal in Stakeholder Media, LLC, and the host of the Stakeholder Podcast. Ed, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Uh, thanks, Todd. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, you know, I note on your website, it says you're an interesting guy. I mean, I, I listed a lot of things there in your bio, but tell me something interesting about yourself. Uh, well, I don't, <laughs> I, I really don't know if I'm interesting or not. Uh, you know, uh, people ask me if I have any hobbies and I say, well, you know, um, I teach, I write, I travel around and talk to pe people. Um, I play music, I write music, I work out a lot, do martial arts. I don't really have time to have a hobby. <laughs> so, you know, life is life is is rich and full. That is fantastic. Well, that makes you interesting. And really, any good leader is uh, is is more than just their job. I mean, they they uh, do lots of things. They find inspiration in a lot of areas. So. I think that stands to reason. One of my colleagues put it best. Uh, he said, look, there's time to be well-rested when you're dead. <laughs> the, the issue is just you don't want to hasten the process. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like that. Well, that's that's where the martial arts and working out help. So, um, Well, this is fascinating. I discovered your book. Well, I don't remember how I discovered your book, but I, I initially saw Plato and leadership linked together, and I thought, well, this is interesting because – I, once upon a time, was a classics major at Boston University, and I dabbled in the philosophers, you know, just, just enough to make myself dangerous, just like I dabble in leadership now, just enough to make, make myself dangerous. So can you, can you just kind of frame this for us? What, what kind of a leader was Plato? Well, uh, let me uh, step back just for a second and explain a little more about how the book happened because it's not a, a typical leadership book. Uh, Dominic Scott is a, is a Plato professor at Oxford and uh, he had been at Virginia for a while and he and I started talking about things and, and, and working together. And I'm a philosopher by training as well. So this is a book about Plato written by two philosophers, one of whom Dominic, not me, knows a lot about Plato. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Pla Plato was uh, what we call in the book a sower, somebody who sows the seeds of ideas for generations to come. Mm -hmm. the, the leadership person who has talked about this more is Howard Gardner, who talks about, I think, intellectual leadership and thought leadership oftentimes. These are not people who necessarily are you know out on the front lines with lots of people but rather they're leading with their ideas uh, etc and plato was like that i mean he uh he uh, started he started the academy uh his school which is where we get academic at the word academy from uh etc and he was i think profoundly moved uh by uh, the death of his teacher Socrates, uh, and the story that's uh, in one of the dialogues about the the trial and death of Socrates, and so Plato, Athens of the time was was tricky. There was a uh, there was a lot of controversy about how democracy was going to work, and. Um, Plato had experience uh, with lots of different kinds of leaders. Uh, and I think this, in part, uh, affected the way he saw it. He didn't have one model of 
leadership. And uh, I think many of the people who write about leadership today want to find that kind of one model and force everything to fit in that. Plato had a much different idea and, and really a more sophisticated idea. Um, Dominic and I treat leadership in Plato as what philosophers would call a family resemblance idea. In other words, if you if you try to define certain concepts like game or leadership or another one I think is business, you can't really have a definition that fits everything. But there's kind of a family resemblance between the 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 different metaphors that you use. And so Plato had a number of metaphors, uh, especially in the Republic, uh, of teacher, of doctor, of navigator and captain, of uh, sower, of artist, of shepherd. And he thought there were insights in all of these things, all of these roles that uh, leaders could learn from. Mm. And what's interesting to me is that you've you've defined each of these and you've used examples from his work and examples of modern day leaders that we can relate to and and they get fit into one of these categories but no single one of those leaders really no uh, single one of any uh, of the leaders that we know squarely fits into these i mean it's really a kind of that's a, right it, it, it's like a like one of those 3d graphs where you see there's seven points on it and uh, your your relevance shifts from one point to another depending on who you are depending on the context in which your your leadership lands etc that's right and that's again i think part of the idea that leadership is sort of a a family resemblance idea the the idea to find the one and only one way to define it always for everybody, for every situation, is is a little bit of a, well, I would call it a fool's errand if, if I wasn't. <laughs> well, um, if, if we can, I, I would love to explore a few of these models a little more sure. in depth so people can understand them. Um, you start out with uh, the doctor, and I think this was probably the most prominent one in Plato's time because it... Uh, it, it coalesced with the scientific knowledge that was upcoming. And as we look around now in the middle of a pandemic, we're looking to a lot of experts or so-called experts. We're looking for more certainty. We're looking to scientists. And talk a little bit about the role of the doctor and what it is that that kind of a leader, sh- uh, leader brings to the table. Well, the doctor knows things about what's in your interest that you may not know. Uh, the doctor may know what's good for you. Uh, even though you don't. Uh, and so um, the difficulty here for the doctor is to persuade you in a way to accept the cure. And we certainly see that today where uh, I think the the doctor or, or in some case the scientist, we might uh, up, update that too. The scientist knows um, how COVID works in much more detail than than any of us know. Uh, and yet the part of the scientist's job as leader is to convince us to, uh, that, that what the scientist, what she knows is something that's, that's good for us. Um, you know, um, so it's not just the technical expertise. It's the, it's the difficulty in, getting people to accept that. And Plato was very uh, hesitant to think that rhetoric was, was, was always helpful. You know, so the doctor works for the benefit of the followers. They, they don't pursue their own self-interest. That, that's the idea about being uh, a doctor and do no harm. And that's, that comes through uh, to the modern uh, time. But I can know what your interest is uh, and still not be able to convince you of that. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult thing that I think we find relevant today. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me, let me start with this. We, we hear a lot of people saying, follow the science and in, let's just take it in the con, in the construct of the, the pandemic. Science is certainly important. 
Um, but it, it's one of a number of things that are wrapped up in these bigger societal and policy based decisions that a leader's job isn't necessarily to be a scientist, but it's to listen to scientists as well as other advisors who are on their uh, on their team. Well, it, well, again, you you've got a view of leadership. I, I think that that um, play, the, the idea is the leader who sees themselves like the doctor. Uh, their job is to try and uh, get people to to um, to take the cure, uh, if you like. Uh, so uh, this this idea of the leader as this generalist who, you know, looks at doctors and navigators and teachers and shepherds and sewers and artists uh, and looks at all those perspectives. I, I'm not I'm not sure. Well, that's certainly not Plato's view. <laughs> he was he was just kind of tackling one at a time. Then. Well, yeah, because the idea is different situations yeah. require different uh different roles and again you have to remember these are these are metaphors right uh, they're, they're they're models so there's not one model for everything um i i sort of like the idea that you know you can take some principles from each of these models mm-hmm. and we, we try in the book to to say well here are the three or four print principles for each one um and you know those are pretty good prints principles but the trick is in the is in judgment, is in figuring out when 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 they apply and and when they don't. Right. And and I would take it that that is something that a more experienced leader would be able to uh, kind of uh, shape shift between some of those uh, the, well, those models. You hope so, but sometimes more experienced leaders are so set in their ways uh, <laughs> they can't do that. So I think that's a, a a fairly dangerous assumption that experience will lead you to uh, be uh, more more open and curious. Well, what? I, uh, go ahead. No, that's all. Oh, I, I was just going to ask you, what about the flip side of that? The the inexperience, because usually when people are tapped for their first management position, their first position in which they need to oversee people rather than projects, they're usually selected by virtue of having been a, a an excellent individual contributor. Yeah, they, right. They were an expert in some area. And, and this is where we hear about, you know, Plato's uh, faith in expertise. Um, how does, how does right. that kind of expertise then play into leadership for an inexperienced leader? Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, we've ruined many good individual contributors by turning them into managers. Uh, and, of course, expertise, there's the expertise in the subject matter, but then there's a, a different kind of expertise that's required in terms of understanding people. Uh, and I think this is something which, again, Plato writes about it a little bit, and and this is in part why the um, I've always found this pretty amusing. The 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 highest leaders in his republic were philosopher kings. Okay. Uh, I know a lot of philosophers, and I don't I don't think <laughs> I, I don't know where that came from, but it it didn't come from the people at the American Philosophical Association. <laughs> well. I'm pretty uh, about that. Maybe it goes back to the old precept of know thyself. Well, you know, there is one there is one important difference that I think uh, we can learn from play, from Plato here. Um, many people talk about uh, leading with integrity. They talk about responsible leadership. They talk about ethical leadership. I've written some stuff about this before I. I uh, I worked on this this book. Plato didn't have an idea about about that. Plato Plato's because he thought leadership was something that was a good thing for the most part, and he contrasts leaders with tyrants. Uh, I mean, hmm. if you if you ask people, I've done this for probably several thousand people. 
um, the, the first two names that come to mind when you think about leadership. A non-zero number of them will give you um, names like Hitler and some other pretty bad people. And the idea is, well, you know, they weren't good people, but they sure could get things done. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't enough. Being a leader was not just about getting thing, things done. It was about getting the right things done the right way. It was about knowing the right and doing the right. Uh, and so I think Plato was willing to call tyrants tyrants uh, and not give them, because leadership's a little bit of an honorific. If I say you're a leader, uh, I'm kind of saying, you, I'm starting with the idea that you're okay and you're doing something that's noble. And Plato didn't think that was right. He thought they were they were tyrants. And certainly in today's world, I'd like to see us go back to calling out tyrants. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And yeah, even in a, a more innocuous way, you know, it's the difference, as people have uh, outlined before, the difference between a boss and a leader, um, you know, if you, if you want to stick to the workplace uh, kind of thing. So. And Santa, I just want to be clear. I don't make any of my colleagues in philosophy angry. I'm actually not a professor of philosophy. Uh, I'm just a philosopher who's, who hangs out at the business school. <laughs> there, there you go. Well, you know, I think it's fascinating. I just want to talk about your, your career for a little bit of this intersection of business and philosophy. Um, oftentimes, yeah. those of us in the humanities, if that's where we've gotten our degrees, um, are, are often viewed as either you go into academics or it's some dead-end job or you end up doing something that is completely unrelated to your field of yeah. study. I'm interested to see where you found the intersection of business and philosophy, how you brought those together, particularly around leadership. Well, uh, for starters, it was luck. Uh, when I was finishing my Ph.D. in philosophy at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, one of the people on my committee said, you know, you should do a postdoc. And one of the places he mentioned was Wharton. And, of course, I was in my early 20s. I, I'd never heard of Wharton. And um, I, I, he said, it's a business school. And I said, well, is it a good one? He said, well, it's, you know, one of the best. And then I said, where is it? Because I, I literally didn't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, well, well, it's in Philadelphia. And uh, I said, well, I might be interested because my girlfriend was going to grad school at Penn. And, and so I show up at Wharton for love or lust or whatever it was. It was the 70s. Uh, we've been married for 45 years, so that worked out. Um, in being at a business school, I, I was really interested in, yeah. Look, Socrates tells us that, that the main ethical question is how should we live our lives? Theoretical philosophy in many instances had moved so far away from that uh, that it became, uh, to me, uh, disjointed. There, there was this big... Uh, you know, gap between thinking about how you live your life and the humanities readings that, that I was doing. And business schools were very much, certainly Warden, was very much involved in what's going on in the world. And so I, I was able to take the sort of philosophical point of view uh, that I had and, and, and had studied and try and apply it to business. Um, and the the first the first thing was this stakeholder idea. Uh, that seemed pretty straightforward to me. In fact, when I wrote that old book that you mentioned in the intro, uh, that's gotten so many citations now. I didn't even think the stakeholder idea was the most interesting idea in the book because I thought well, this is just so this is just so obvious that nobody's gonna nobody's gonna argue with this. I mean, you know, I grew up poor on a dirt farm in Georgia, but we knew you had to deal with the people you could affect and the people that could affect you. So why was business any different than that? Uh, and so as I gradually began to, to, you know, be more confident that my training in philosophy actually had something, uh, something important to say about business, uh, you know, and if I could say it in a way uh, that wasn't 
too technical that, that didn't uh, you know that that didn't call for people to do completeness proofs in in first order predicate logic, which you know I could do, but you know I've never had really <laughs> this for it. We have uh, we have a listener who'd like to participate. We have sure. Bob. <laughs> you have the microphone. Go ahead. Okay. First of all, uh, I'm up there in my age. I'm about I'll be 75 next month. And uh, I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps from 1966 through 1987. Thank you for your service, Bob. Oh, you're welcome. And, of course, I was in Vietnam in 66, 67, and 68. And in the Marine Corps, and you can take these and apply these, we call them uh, traits of leadership. And what they are is you have integrity, knowledge, courage, decisiveness, dependability, initiative, tact, justice, <clears throat> enthusiasm, bearing, endurance, unselfishness, loyalty, and judgment. And all those can be applied in the civilian world, which is what I did, and I was very successful in the civilian world, and I never went to college. But I did what I depended on were my traits of leadership and how to lead. And then for my leadership principles, you need to be technically and technically proficient. You need to know yourself and seek self-improvement. You need to know your men and look out for their welfare, which is taking care of your people if you're a manager, okay? And if you follow all those traits and those principles, you'll be a very successful leader. Yeah, I, I, I love that, Bob. I mean, it, it sounds like, like Plato could have been a Marine, but well, it could have been. I don't know. Uh, Plato. Plato was a was a soldier, a part of his uh, yeah. career. He had soccer. Yeah. He's both. You know, like I said, I've followed all these traits, and these traits are they they'll lead you through life. Trust me. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank thank you so much for sharing uh, those those precepts, uh, Bob. I think those are uh, you know universal. I think they are. Uh, well, they're, they're, they're human nature uh, traits, really. Well, thanks again for your service, Bob, and uh, Semper Fi. Yep, Semper Fi. All right. Well, Ed, uh, what do you think about uh, some of those uh, universal human traits there? These, these are kind of the things that we can still draw out of Plato 2,000-plus years later. Uh, uh, sure. I mean, I think Bob Ray raises a lot of, uh, a lot of good points. Again, I, I'm a little skeptical of kind of one model that lists a lot of things. Uh, I mean, those things conflict some sometimes, and you have to have judgment to figure out which ones are important in which situation. So of course. I think there are other things that can that can help you do do that. Yeah. Thinking about the metaphor, for instance, of of a doctor might might not be very helpful for a Marine in combat, but it might be very helpful to uh, a manager who's trying to figure out uh, how to how to treat uh, employees fairly in a situation like COVID. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think you know it really really depends a lot on the on the kind of person you are. Not everybody's cut out to be a marine. Not everybody's cut out to be uh, uh, a doctor or a teacher. So that's why I like the yeah. the multiplicity of models uh, that you find in. Now I said I remember doing a PhD seminar with my students, with my doctoral students, some a few years ago. We we're going to do it on leadership, and so we had them read kind of all the academic literature. And what they told me was, uh, look, the only thing the academics can agree on is that uh, leaders, for the most part, are tall. <laughs> that didn't seem to me to be terribly helpful. I'm about five nine, five ten, so it especially didn't seem very helpful. Wow. Uh, so I, you know, I I like to fall back on the on the sort of common sense uh, models, etc., and met metaphors that that we can use. Yeah, uh, you know, some I think it'd be interesting to to uh, think through the leader as Maureen. Because we see something in Marines that we don't always see uh, in every soldier. That is true. 
That is true. And and ultimately, I think there, if there is one universal quality of uh, leaders that kind of spans between all of these models, it has to be discernment or judgment, the ability to know which That's attribute right. of leadership or model of leadership you need to apply at any given moment. Uh, and to know if you can or not. Right. Uh, and I, look, I, I have to uh, confess, John, I'm, I'm a little bit of a leadership skeptic. There's a there's a, a brilliant, brilliant management thinker, Jim Collins, who uh, is really uh, his idea. Um, and he said, you know, in the Middle Ages, um, why, why did my crops fail? God did it. Uh, why did my child get sick? God did it. Why did it rain yesterday? God did it. And then as we, as we learn more about the way the world works, we still believe in God. That's, that's not the issue. But, but we would give better explanations. Uh, for for that in management theory it's a little bit you know why did this company succeed leadership <laughs> or why did this company fail leadership uh, why did this project not work out leadership mm. and and Jim became a, a, a sort of the original leadership skeptic here um, and I, I, you know I, I, I there's there is a a, a a way in business schools and businesses to attribute much more causality, I think, to leadership than is there. It is important, but it's important to be nuanced about it. Right. To try to think about uh, what what you really know about uh, what causes things to happen. And so I, I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit of a skeptic to attribute so much to leadership as important as I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's important. I mean, as, as you say, there are many factors that go into um, a, a success or failure of any given <clears throat> element. So, uh, but I do have to say, Ed, that you are the first leadership skeptic we've had on timeless leadership. So <laughs> congratulations. Well, it's uh, it's uh, it's an idea just stolen from Jim Collins. So. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it applies here. So, well, uh, you know, it was interesting. He, he, when he was writing good to great, I think it was, and his researchers, as he tells the story, had to have kind of an intervention. They, they had to sit him down and go, now wait, Leadership is important. What we found is in these companies that go from being pretty good to really great, what we found is that, first of all, what's important is the leaders are um, have a high degree of humility mm. and a kind of uh, fierce determination. And it's that fierce determination around purpose and humility that that characterize leadership. It's not the loud, you know, uh, get things done, um, charismatic leader. It's it's the leader who's humble, who understands people, yeah. who um, you know has a kind of fierce determination around purpose. Uh, and that was, you know, if if you if you were to say write down the top characteristics of most. Fortune 100 CEOs, probably humility doesn't come to about number 73. <laughs> well, it's interesting you should say that because one of the people we interviewed in the first season of this show was Marilyn Gist, who wrote The Extraordinary yeah. Power of Leader Humility. And yeah. her uh, one of the major contributors to the book was my old boss, Alan Mullally at Ford Motor yeah. Company. Sure. And it, when when you turned to Alan and you congratulated him on some major accomplishment of the company, yeah. his immediate response wasn't certainly wasn't to take credit for it. It wasn't even to say thank you. He would say right. it's an honor to serve. And yeah. it, it was that that combination of humility and servant leadership tied together that made him so inspirational and made people want to follow what it was he was putting out there. Uh, yes, I think that's absolutely right, and and I also think one of the things that's happened is, is people have gotten the message. Right. Look, uh, as as one of my uh, CEO friends says, only assets I manage to go up and down the elevator, 
And so you you have to think about what you're – and what we try to get students to understand is you need to think about what uh, – how you think about what makes people tick. Right. You know, if you think people are one-dimensional, short-term, self-interested, only think about themselves, economic beings, essentially sociopaths, but if that's what you think, which is what a lot of our management theory says – you're probably not going to be very successful. Mm. Uh, if you think people are complicated and, and it's really not kind of one size fits all, uh, then I think you have a chance. And I, I think people are complicated. Yes, we yeah. can be self-interested, but we can also, anyone who's ever been in love or who's ever had a child knows we're incapable, we're capable of great acts of kindness, mm -hmm. great acts of uh, love and affection and acting for others as well. Um, and so seeing that sort of, and this is where I would go back to say the, the richness of the humanities uh, comes in because it's in the humanities where we learn about the, the richness of human life, the things that we can uh, do and that we're capable of. We, we look at the poets, we look at the novelists, uh, we look at the playwrights, um, and we look at the theories about those things. We look at art. The, these are the places where we get the richness and diversity uh, of, of human beings. And you're, um, you're speaking my language. This is exactly where I draw my inspiration from my newsletter every week. History, literature, the arts, philosophy, yeah. it's, it's all out there. It's all been done before. We're we're just on a a constant repeat cycle with new context every time around, and we need them in business schools. Yes, yes, we do. We need not just economics and finance. That stuff's important. I'm not arguing it's not. Uh, I'm very lucky to be at a place where I've taught uh, a course called Ethics Through Literature. I've taught a course called Leadership Through Theater, uh, and a, a course called Working Together uh, Through Music. Um, and, you know, um, the humanities here are sort of alive and well uh, and a part of a, a business school education here at the Darden School. And I, I've got the best job in the world because of that. Fantastic. I love that. Well, we have a couple of people who are interested in joining the conversation. Uh, first, we have uh, Ali and John. You're next up in the queue. Ali, welcome to Timeless Leadership with Ed Freeman. First of all, I'm a big fan of um, uh, Professor, Friedman's, uh, Fr Professor um, Freeman's work. Um, extensively cited in my PhD. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak to speak to him and, and thank him for all his work. Uh, one of the things that um, really strikes me, and I'm, I'm kind of, I teach leadership at the moment at, at various business schools, but I'm at York at the moment, uh, York in the UK. And one of the things that strikes me at the moment is there's a conversation happening about whether we should move on from Western-based uh, um capitalist based models onto something else that we can find from other civilizations and other histories that are there from. And from my background, I come from a background from South Asia and um, obviously our Persian and Arabic roots to that as well. And we're always looking for other ways of opening up and uh, opening up the discussion of leadership that includes those um, philosophies, those backgrounds, those uh, civilizations, those histories, those cultures. And it seems there's a tension here both on in terms of how we think about leadership um, as being a very kind of Western, very male, very capitalistic um, construct at the moment. Um, it's very much based on CEOs and big leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not saying that doesn't exist in, in, in say, Persian literature. We have the Shahnameh. Um, in Chinese literature, we have the, the, the romance, um, the romances of, um, and, and the work by some of the Confucian scholars. So, but it, ha, the question would be that if we've got such a rich history of art and literature and, and, and discussions on leadership from different cultures, Aside from being obsessed with Sun Tzu, which every business school is, and quote, the art of war, <laughs> art of war extensively, usually out of context. <laughs> Apart from those things, how do we bring in more diverse human experience of leadership into the field of leadership and discussion of leadership? Because at the moment, it's very Western-centric. Um, it's very male-centric. And, and 
people say look to the future is becoming more diverse. If you look at the tech CEOs at the moment, people like Elon Musk and guys like that, that model of leadership is very, very masculine, very kind of centered on 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 the image of the man as a great leader. So it's a very interesting point in history that we are at the moment, um, especially because I think we're having a bit of a crisis of leadership with, them, um, with, with kind of the kind of leaders that we have and a crisis of, uh, maybe a crisis of legitimacy as well in terms of how we understand leadership. So there's a lot there for you, uh, Professor Freeman. So let me hand it over to you. Well, I would say, look, that's very uh, in, interesting, Ali. And uh, I, I would approach it in two ways. One, the extent to which um, our ideas about leadership are uh, or are male or masculine, uh, I think it's uh, very straightforward. It's a, it's a reflection of... It's a reflection in part of uh, Western society. However, if you look uh, very hard, you can find uh, terrific examples of women leaders. And what we need to do is find uh, many more of those. Uh, We try and do a little bit of that in the book with Maria Montessori and uh, Florence Nightingale and Marie Curie uh, (coughs) and Indra Nooyi. Uh, from uh, former CEO of Pepsi, uh, but I think so. That's one thing is to is to specifically find uh, examples of women leaders, and there are lots of those now. The the second piece, though, is the cultural piece. And um, Western society isn't the only masculine oriented society. Uh, many many others uh, that are not necessarily capitalistic are masculine as well. And again, I think we have to find examples of women leaders. Uh, Where I've been able to find ways to get people to talk about this is to look at uh, text, you know, like the Mahabharat, like the uh, like novels uh, and short stories. Uh, It's it's an incredible uh, time in literature in the world, incredible flowering of literature in, in the world. Uh, short stories are great because they are they are the right length for business school classes. Mm. Uh, and typically, you can find short stories in uh, one of the one of my favorite. Uh, um, Compendiums is a is a long reprinted book called The Art of the Tale, and the art in the Art of the Tale, there's short stories from all over the world, but there there are all kinds of 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 of, of these short stories and novels, uh, and people writing all over the world, and I would look there uh, because in many of those uh, short stories and novels, you will find people dealing with uh, with leadership things. Not Thanks. necessarily in the let me tell you how to get things done uh, sense. Thank you for that. that. That was really enlightening. I have a colleague called Shane Hamilton who's actually using literature and short stories on one of our courses at York yeah. uh, to master students. So he's developing that concept, and it's actually one of our more successful courses. It's really opened the eyes of a lot of the um, postgrads that we have coming into the course. What, what, what I was really interested in was really the kind of civilizational aspect of it. I think. Yeah. Where we open up the channel, not necessarily the masculine or feminine side, but also where we open up the different perspectives. I spent quite a lot of time in, in South Africa when I was working. And the, the experience of leadership amongst the South African community, especially amongst people who had, um, who had experienced Madiba and experienced the ANC revolutionaries and the comrades from Robben Island with a very different idea of leadership that, that actually did kind of chime with what I read with you with, um, with the stakeholder theory in that it was about partaking and sharing and, and, and sharing a truth, sharing a, sharing a, legit, a legitimacy of the truth of knowing that the truth and that, that you have is something that empowers you to be a leader and knowing that truth is legitimate. So everyone agrees that truth is essential and then using that truth itself to be able to orientate your roles around the idea of leadership. So I was, I was kind of thinking maybe that a different way of looking at at leadership than just this model of um, you know, we have a list of things that we have to do, we're going to put it in a book and stick it in the airport 
um, you know, that, that kind yeah. of model that, that's very prevalent, you know, 50, 50 rules of this and 20 rules of that and yeah. five habits of that, that and the other. So I was thinking what you think about that. Well, I agree with you. I think, I think that's, uh, you know, you've got to try to open up students' minds, uh, and students, whether they're executives or, or, or 19, you want to open their minds to, to new, new ideas. Fortunately, we have this wonderful technology called reading that lets us do that, <laughs> you know, and it's, but we often don't understand how important that is. Mm-hmm. And here I mean reading, but there, you know, also film and TV and all kinds of other things. Rather than find an echo chamber, I mean, I'm always trying to read something that I don't know anything about and that for the most part I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. If I'm not pushing myself that way, then I'm just, I mean, it feels good to, you know, when you say, I like, you know, I really enjoy your, uh, your, stakeholder work and it's it's influenced me and i appreciate that uh but i need to be dealing with stuff where you know i don't really understand it yeah thank you very much for the time great Thanks. ali thank you for your your question uh there ed ed that that notion of seeking out alternative points of view i mean it's it, it can be difficult for people uh, these days to engage with something they inherently disagree with in, in, in a way where they're curious to learn rather than simply uh, when they're in a position to counter something. Um, h- right. how, do you, how do you get people to open up their minds to wanting to accept information that doesn't necessarily inform their bias? Well, um, I mean, I, I guess on the first day of class, I try and give people a trigger warning <laughs> that if this class is successful, it's going to make them uncomfortable. That's fair. Um, we used to use a paper uh, called uh, White Male Privilege to uh, teach about race, and it was a set of privileges, and I, I forget the author, I apologize to her, Um but it was a set of things like if I have a bad week, a bad day, a bad month, I don't attribute it to race. If I walk into a, a drugstore, I'll find bandages that are my skin color. Uh, if I'm a stopped by the police, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's going to be a friendly, mm. you know, and there are 40 or 50 of these things. And it, it used to piss people off a lot. <laughs> um, and thank goodness. Yeah. Because it got them to think differently, so I think finding texts that make people uncomfortable uh, is a good thing. We don't we don't deal with that very well now. We've we've maybe in society lost the ability to do to do that. Socrates went around making people uncomfortable. He's yeah. a total pain in the ass, and he was executed for corrupting the youth. You know by by which you know force you know having the youth think about stuff in non-traditional ways. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we ought to do more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Not less. We're, we're, we're seeing, you know, this whole outcry of, uh, you know, school districts against CRT when CRT isn't even ta- taught at the elementary school yeah. level. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, you know, one of these things that people are outraged about when in fact it's about embracing the reality of our history and yes. if it makes you uncomfortable, so be it. But it's about creating conversations, and that's what leaders do. They create conversations. Yes, exactly. In fact, I've said if you if your your main job as a leader is to figure out what conversations does my organization need to have, if you can do that, and you got good people, they'll figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. Your job is to shape the conversation. Yeah, you know. Um, the leaders of the Darden School uh, always try to shape a conversation around how can we be the best teaching institution in the world, mm. um, and and that's and we talk about that a lot. Yeah, and uh, we don't always get it right by any means, but well, that's part of the conversation. Absolutely, and I think every good leader understands that that they're not always going to get something right. It's about a journey. It's not about just the destination. 
Scottsdale. Yeah. Um, speaking of destinations, we are getting close to the top of the hour here, and John has been waiting so patiently here to come up to the microphone. John, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, you know, Dr. Piemann of uh, work also. I had the privilege to uh, had a class with him on ethics with AES Corporation, and uh, his famous so what question is still stuck with me. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to get a little bit of feel. Obviously, this time is constrained. So my question is, those, these leadership models, do they have certain implicit assumptions about the followers also? Or, or, or it's a generic thing for all that assumptions about the followers is pretty much same across all these models for leadership. Uh, John, that's a great question. I, I, I think Plato was clever enough to, to realize that, uh, you, you couldn't talk about leadership without talking about what the effect on followers were, uh, and how, especially in a model like the navigator, where, you know, the navigator has to point the ship to the place that they want to go, and a lot of people don't want to go there. They 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 don't want to go the way the navigator knows to to get get there. And one of the one of the examples in the book was a was a guy I had the privilege of knowing, Arch McGill, at the old Bell system in the U.S. And and Arch knew where to go, and I'm pretty sure he knew how to get there, uh, but he couldn't figure out the followers. He couldn't figure out again this problem of persuasion that Plato seems to be obsessed with, uh, was, was a tricky one. Real leadership has to have, you know, real leadership to me in whatever model it is, is leadership by choice, uh, not leadership by authority. Many people think they're great leaders because people do what they're told, but uh, they do what they're told because of position, because of, uh, the, you know, the office that somebody has. To be a leader by choice is much more difficult. Um, people have to know the alternatives. They have to, uh, you know, uh, share in, uh, what the, sh- what the, what the purpose is. And that's a, that's a more difficult uh, idea. And it's again one where I think, Humility uh, plays a large role. Thank you for that uh, for that question, John. I'm, I'm glad you were able to reconnect with Ed here. And and Ed, this this notion of leadership and choice. It's Scott, actually, are you still there? Sorry about that. I was on mute. What do you know about that? Um, technology. I chose to be on mute. Yep. Um, no, I, it's uh, thank you, John, for that question. I'm glad you were able to reconnect with uh, Professor Freeman here. Um, and, you know, that idea of leadership and choice, Ed, is really interesting because it, it's almost a preview to another episode we're going to do uh, here with uh, Jim Rafferty, who wrote a book called Leader by Accident. And it's about being put in a situation where leadership is kind of presented to you or not quite forced on you, but you, you're asked to step up. And it's a choice you have to make at that point. Yeah. And, and, and you need to decide whether you're ready for it and your organization needs to decide whether you're ready for it too. So, well, this has been a fascinating discussion. The book is Models of Leadership in Plato Beyond by Dominic Scott and R. Edward Freeman. Um, Ed Freeman, I should mention this before we depart here because I thought it was absolutely fascinating. One part of your bio I did not include was that you are um you're a chef of sorts you you've you've been known to create some masterful meals for your students and you you have an annual competition at the Darden School of Business called the Darden Iron Chef competition <laughs> yeah we we won the first one and then and then we lost and i i, I don't think we've 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 com- we've competed since uh uh since we lost well, what 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 an inspiration for something to get back to. It's nice to uh, talk about books and ideas over over food and wine. I can imagine. Well, Ed, thank you once again for being with us here on Timeless Leadership. Thanks, Scott. The path to leadership is a journey, one that may end in one or more of Plato's models. Whether you're a doctor, navigator, artist, teacher, shepherd, weaver, or sower, 
the signals are there for you to make sense of. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, may you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you are a leader.